Here's your word for the day from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. Well, hey, Calvary, thanks for tuning in for your word for the day today. My name is Robert. We're continuing our five-part look at the life of Samson, and uh, we're going to be in Judges chapter 14. Samson is the 12th in a line of 12 judges in the book of Judges uh, that God used to lead and to guide and correct his people uh, through this period of history. Now, uh, I will probably say this almost every episode. If you did not watch the previous one, please go back and watch. There is uh, some that we, you will need as a foundation. Each of these really build off of each other to understand the life of Samson as a whole. So go back uh, to yesterday's episode if you missed this one and then come back. Okay, welcome back. I'm just kidding. Uh, so let's take a look. Judges 14, we're going to read. Uh, there's a couple of really significant events that happen here. This one might be a little long uh, for you. I apologize in advance, but there's a lot in this chapter. So Judges 14, starting in verse 1, says this. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. He came up and told his father and his mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives, among all of our people, that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking opportunity against the Philistines at the time the Philistines ruled over Israel. So Samson goes and finds himself a wife. What could be so wrong about that, right? Well, quite a bit, actually, as you guess from maybe the negative tone. First is a, a person of God. He was prohibited from marrying a Philistine, specifically and implicitly prohibited from going and intermarrying outside of God's people. That is a big deal. And not only does it go against the, the specific rule against which type of people he's supposed to be marrying, he also goes against the tradition of marriages being arranged. Now, I'm very thankful I live in a time that marriages are not arranged, but that wasn't Samson. And so even his request and say, go fetch her for me as a wife completely goes against the culture and really gets at the bigger issue with this situation, which you get in his own statement in verse three. But Samson said to his father, get her for me for she is right in my eyes. This reality is going to be a part of Samson's uh, issues and story for the next few episodes as we go through the next three chapters. Samson is more concerned about what he wants, what's right in his eyes, than what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Now again, twice in the book of Deuteronomy, God's people are commanded and instructed to do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. But Samson seemed to be more concerned with what was right in his eyes. And specifically, it was this female. We'll later learn that Samson also had an issue with picking the wrong, wrong type of women and behaving incorrectly with them. That'll be later on. But what's so interesting is that the person who is called to lead God's people and correct and judge them is unfortunately so accurately reflecting their downfall in what Scripture defines as doing what was right in their own eyes. In fact, three times as the book of Judges close, actually corrected four times as it close, Scripture defines that in this period, God's people just did what was right in their own eyes. And for Samson, he's going to struggle. That is going to be his downfall, not to spoil the story completely, but part of the struggle he will have is the fact that he does what is right in his own eyes. But this marriage leads to future problems in the present. We'll keep reading and kind of see what happens with this. But there's another kind of foundational moment that happens here. Verse 5, it continues, And Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion came out toward him, roaring. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. And when he had went down and talked with the woman of Timnah, and she was right in Samson's eyes. And some days he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there's a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out of his hands and went on, eating as he went. He came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Now, physical strength aside, and also, uh, I don't know about you, but that statement, as one tears a young goat. I've never torn a young goat apart. Apparently, I'm a weakling. But, but he does it to a lion. 
physical strength aside, here's some really interesting things. If you remember yesterday, we talked about the Nazarite vow. What are some of the things of the Nazarite vow? One, you're not to eat, uh, uh, you're not to drink wine or strong drink. Secondly, you're not to go near a dead body. He not only goes near it, but he creates it uh, by killing and tearing this lion apart. He creates it. It's going to be a little trend we'll see from Samson as well. But then when he's returning, he not only goes near the body of the car or the carcass of this lion that he tears as one tears a young goat, he not only goes near it, but he goes and eats the honey out of it. Disgusting. I like honey, but not out of dead bodies. Samson doesn't care, seemingly, about the vow he's taken, except for when it, it benefits him. It continues and goes on that, that this moment actually was pretty big, that this lion and the honey that he created. It, uh, chapter 14 continues that there's a, there's a big wedding feast for him and this Philistine bride. And, and part of this feast is all these Philistines that become his groomsmen. And, and Samson's feeling a little spicy and he goes, hey, I'm going to do a little bet for you guys. Let's do a riddle. If you guys can solve the riddle in the seven days of this feast, I'll give you each, all 30 of you, just uh, this wonderful set of clothes, just an incredible lavish gift, he says. And the, the, the riddle is, um, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of strong came something sweet. Now we reading this go, oh, he's talking about the honey and, and that came out of the lion. They don't get it. They didn't know that this happened. And they began to torment uh, Samson's new wife, this Philistine bride that he had selected. And, and they threaten her. They say, hey, you're, you need to tell us what the answer is, or we're going to burn you and your household. You need to tell us the answer. So she begins to torment Samson. It says every day of the feast, she's crying before him. You can tell there's manipulation, there's coercion, until he gives him the, her the answer. She goes and tells her Philistine friends and family, and they solve the riddle, and they go, we know the answer. Well, he's obviously upset. He's got to pay this prize that he wasn't planning on, didn't have the resources. So he goes to a town over and kills 30 Philistines to steal their items and bring back for their prize. And the chapter ends with this. It says, and Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. That will be important for tomorrow. What do, what do we learn from this? This is Samson's all over the place. He's supposed to be the righteous man of God to save his people from the Philistines, and he is a hot mess. Well, see, I wonder if it really all boils down to doing what is right in our own eyes. Samson seemed to do what was right in his own eyes with the, with the lion, with the honey that was in the lion, with the bride that he wanted, with how he navigated the party, how he, pray, he paid for the prize that he wasn't planning on. And we'll see that this trend of Samson leads to his life not going the way he wanted it to. And I wonder if some of you watching are trying to live your life doing what's right in your own eyes and expecting God to bless it. In some category, or maybe in big, lavish ways, you're saying, I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what Scripture says. This is what feels right to me. We live in an era that wants to define truth based on our feelings and, and convictions, not on a universal truth. Now, as Christians, we get that from God's Word. So let me encourage you to really examine your life. Is there a place that you're living based on what's right in your eyes and not what's best in the sight of the Lord? And if so, let me challenge you to really start to consider what it would look like for you to bring that into obedience. Because only when we live as best we can doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord will he bless and enrich in our life. Because really at the end of the day, when we do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, we're just living the life that he created and planned for us from the beginning. So let me challenge you to do that and to stop living based on what's right in your own eyes. We'll see you tomorrow, Calvary. Have a good one.